In the year 1802, the fur trade was running its course throughout what was to become Western Canada, transforming every part of the land and culture it touched. Competition between the trading companies had heated up, and European settlement on the prairies was only a decade away. At the age of 33, Hudson's Bay Company surveyor and explorer Peter Fiddler had already accumulated a lifetime of achievements. He had lived with native tribes, spearheaded the operation of trading posts, and mapped thousands of miles of waterways. Fiddler's service for the Hudson's Bay Company would span more than three decades, but it was within the second half of his career that he would face his most dangerous and challenging assignments. Only his knowledge, experience, and steadfast loyalty would carry him through. In the fur-rich region of Lake Athabasca, the Northwest Company had risen to dominance. Hundreds of traders swarmed around the lake, reaping the rich harvest of beaver skins. In an effort to compete, the Hudson's Bay Company decided to send Peter Fiddler to establish a post. The competition turned out to be cutthroat and unrelenting. The Norwesters began antagonizing Fiddler's party with constant harassment, stopping at nothing to ensure a failed season of trading. They burned Fiddler's canoe. They scared away game. Natives, brave enough to attempt trading, were harassed or bribed. Before long, the whole assignment had fallen apart. As had happened so many times before, the Hudson's Bay Company men found themselves completely under-equipped. As a result, the Norwesters knew they could push their competition around. And that's what they did, day and night. Yet, at the order of his employers, Fiddler was to return the next year, and the two years after that as well. Despite constant threats, bullying and intimidation, Fiddler held on in the Athabasca until 1806. He only survived that winter by making a deal with the Norwesters, wherein he agreed to cease trading in exchange for safe passage from the region with furs. As a parting gift, the Norwesters went back on their promise, and Fiddler returned to York Factory with his family, almost empty-handed. I think everyone in a competitive situation gets driven to actions and behavior that are really very unfortunate and very damaging. People are trying to please their superiors, they're trying to keep their jobs, they're trying to be productive, they're trying to show results. And the posts are being placed right next to each other because that's the way people seem to compete. You know, like big box stores and so on going right next to each other, same kind of thing in, in capitalist systems. It's, it's a terrible time to live through. Fiddler's life from 1807 to 1811 was a flurry of exploration, survey, and post management. But the hard work had taken its toll, and by the fall of 1811, a weathered and worn Fiddler decided to return home to England for a much needed year's rest. And so he returned to his hometown of Balsiver in Derbyshire, where he purchased a new home for his mother. Then he very likely visited the grave of his father who had passed away two years earlier and had been laid to rest near the little church where Peter had been baptized. While Fiddler was back home, new developments had been taking place in North America. Lord Selkirk is probably one of the most fascinating characters in Canadian history. He's fascinating because his motives are very complex. Uh, he's a man who actually believes that you can do good and make money at the same time, that there ought not to be a conflict between the two things. Selkirk had a plan. The philanthropic part involved transplanting displaced Highland Scots 
into a new settlement at the forks of the Red and Assiniboine Rivers. The financial payoff would come to the Hudson's Bay Company as the settlement's strategic location would begin to interrupt the Northwest Company's flow of provisions. The project was riddled with problems from the start. The first batch of colonists had arrived on the same ship that would bring Fiddler to England. They had proved to be a slow group of travellers who did not anticipate the harsh life ahead of them. When Fiddler returned from England the following summer, he was thrust into the perils of helping to create what could be considered Manitoba's first company town, a community with the thinly veiled purpose of improving business conditions for the Hudson's Bay Company. Over the next year, Fiddler moved between escorting colonists from Hudson's Bay to managing the Brandon House Post, 125 miles west of the Red River settlement. He helped the colonists any way he could. Over the next few years, there would have to be gardens grown, shelters built, and more colonists would arrive at Hudson's Bay every year. But Fiddler knew the Northwest Company was enraged by the settlement and would do anything to see it fail. Appointed as the official governor of the settlement was Miles MacDonnell, a man who made several poor decisions in governing the community. Pemmican was the fuel for the fur trade. MacDonnell's famous Pemmican proclamation would forbid all export of Pemmican from the Red River region, an attack aimed at the Norwesters. Then, MacDonnell pronounced the act of hunting buffalo on horseback illegal. The local Métis had mastered this skill and were outraged. Selkirk had never considered the Métis a factor in his new settlement, a mistake that was about to cost him and the community dearly. An alliance had been forming between the Norwesters and Métis, and a young man named Cuthbert Grant had risen to lead a new uprising against the colony. Cuthbert Grant seems on the whole to have been quite bright, quite personable, and typically pretty ruthless. Uh, but uh, of course, if you were gonna be successful in this Western Indian territory where there was no law and order, the, the way you were successful was through ruthlessness. With the backing of the Northwest Company, Grant and his men began a reign of terror over the settlement, which would intensify over several years. By this point, the Norwesters, Métis, and even the colonists harbored resentment for Miles MacDonnell. He was forced to leave the settlement, and Peter Fiddler was placed in the dubious position of managing the colony and all the turmoil developing around it. Tensions were rising at the Red River settlement. The Norwesters lured colonists away from their homes. Severe violence seemed to be on the verge of breaking out, and rumors of impending attacks began to circulate. Once again, Fiddler had been thrown into an impossible situation from which he would be lucky to survive. June the 10th, 1815, Saturday. About one o'clock this morning, a considerable number of Northwest Company servants passed near our ditch singing a war song. All of us were immediately under arms as we expect attack from them. At daybreak, they also returned singing the war song and bidding us defiance. The violence escalated and a colonist was killed. Fiddler found he had no choice but to sign an agreement with the Norwesters, forcing the colonists to leave the settlement and never return. As Fiddler led the settlers to the safety of Jack River House, they watched as Grant's men burnt their homes and trampled their crops. But some stayed behind. John McLeod, the colony's blacksmith, along with a few others, risked their lives to stay at the colony. Though their crops were ruined and their homes destroyed, these individuals remained and would be a vital element in the next chapter of a war that was far from over. Shortly after the colonists made their escape from the Red River settlement, they were dragged back out of their exile by a disgruntled ex-Norwester named Colin Robertson. Peter Fiddler returned to his duties at Brandon House. 
But in 1816, Robertson's opinionated and swashbuckling style clashed with the ideals of Robert Semple, the colony's official governor. Robertson left the colony and never returned. At the same time, Cuthbert Grant had been travelling down the Assiniboine River, hijacking pemmican and supplies. His men had invaded Brandon House and robbed Fiddler of provisions before continuing down the river. Now they were headed in the direction of the Red River settlement. Fiddler could see that danger was imminent and he had no way of warning the colony. On June 19th, Grant's party landed upriver from the settlement and attempted to pass Fort Douglas on foot. They were spotted. From the watch house, a cry rang out. The half-breeds are coming. The half-breeds are coming. Robert Semple assembled a group of men from the settlement and raced out to intercept Grant's party at the place known as Seven Oaks. Guns were drawn. Tempers flared. A shot was fired. Peter Fiddler was still at Brandon House when his last journal entry indicated he was leaving for the settlement. It has been speculated that he travelled to the Forks days later, only guessing at what was in store for the settlers. If this happened, Fiddler would have witnessed the aftermath of the historic Battle of Seven Oaks, the incident that left Robert Semple and 20 of his men dead and the settlement back in the hands of the Métis and Norwesters. For the Red River settlement, the battle had been a disaster. It is still unclear who fired the first shot, but it sparked a violent retaliation from Grant's party. Years of hunting bison on horseback had made the Métis expert marksmen. The inexperienced colonists didn't stand a chance. The colony had been lost for a second time, but more was in store. That fall, Lord Selkirk, the aristocratic nobleman, the genteel intellectual, turned ruthless. He headed west with a well-trained private army made up of disbanded Swiss soldiers. With the help of Miles MacDonnell, Selkirk and his army captured the Northwest Company's Fort William, then Lac La Pluie, and Fort Dare. Then, in the early morning hours of January the 10th, 1817, Selkirk's mercenaries captured Fort Douglas and for the last time re-established the Red River settlement. Once again, Peter Fiddler began moving colonists back to the forks of the Red and Assiniboine, helping them start again. A new fort was built in the area. It was named Fort Hackett, but everyone called it Fiddler's Fort. During this time, Fiddler busied himself with the operations of the settlement, planting crops and building new homes for the colonists, who now numbered around 150. He began the survey of a river lot system, which ran north from the forks along the banks of the Red River. The outlines of Fiddler's river lot survey can be seen to this day, as they have influenced the geographic layout for what is now the city of Winnipeg. In 1821, Fiddler learned that the Northwest Company had finally fallen. They had overexpanded, and it had cost them dearly. In the end, they were swallowed up by their competitors, the Hudson's Bay Company. When Fiddler heard the news, he was working at Fort Dauphin, a quiet but productive post where he likely had more time to indulge in his love of reading. One of the reasons for putting the fur trading posts at uh, places like Dolphin was the natives who, who trapped in the prairies and all up to the west there, that's one of the routes that they would be coming to go to York Factory. And when placing their, their trading post there, they would intercept that movement. But Fiddler's health had deteriorated badly. It's unclear what illness he suffered while at Fort Dolphin, but several members of his family fell ill. On December 17, 1822, Fiddler died and was buried somewhere in the vicinity of present-day Dauphin. In a twist of cruel irony, the triumph of Fiddler's company, which he had worked so hard to enjoy, had practically coincided with his illness and death. Fiddler's last will and testament was truly eccentric, 
It left a large sum of money behind to collect interest and was to be inherited by a distant relative on August 19, 1969. The scheme failed and the money was dispersed shortly after his death. I'm sure he would have satisfaction in the fact that not only did he do the surveying, but he recorded the surveying. His, it goes on. We have, we have copies of his works to this, to this day in our museum here. And so I'm sure that he had felt satisfaction in accomplishing the things that he did. But in many ways, the most useful thing that Peter Fiddler did, of course, was to collect the library. Peter Fiddler spent most of his adult life uh, buying books in Europe, especially in England, having them sent over to Hudson's Bay. At the time of his death, he had a library of over 500 volumes, easily the largest agglomeration of books anywhere in the fur trade territory, an accomplishment which sort of marks out Fiddler as a special character. Besides his trip to Balsever in 1811, Fiddler never had the chance to revisit his hometown in his old age. But today, the Peter Fiddler legacy survives in Balsever, largely on account of an indirect descendant who has made it her life's work to preserve the memory of Fiddler. My husband's great-great-grandfather, James, was Peter's brother. It's, it's almost an obsession with me. What started off as a hobby, it's now become a way of life. My son used to say, forget Peter Fiddler for a while. You always get the conversation around to it, and it's about all I know. Uh, Bolsover's become a bit of a mecca for the Canadian fiddlers. I've had doctors, lawyers, school teachers. Some have stayed five days, some have stayed five hours. Uh, come to see, and it's always been the house where he was born, the church that he was baptised in, and now the cairn has gone up to him. And we, we call it the Peter Fiddler Estate. Fiddler's loyalty was uh, one of his greatest assets, wasn't it? No matter how hard it had been and how many times he'd left a place, he would still go back. He was never a man to be afraid to go back. What I gather from the other reading I've done, that he was a very quiet man, didn't mince his words, hadn't much time for men that they wouldn't take care of themselves. He never actually rises very far in terms of, of rank. And the critical thing is that um, he's not placed in charge of a major post. He doesn't ultimately become a chief trader or a chief factor in the company. He wasn't probably the sort of person to put himself forward a whole lot. He didn't cultivate a lot of patronage connections. He was busy doing his job. He was busy writing at great length in his journal. I think I like that quality about Fiddler, that he's, um, he's more of an intellectual, he's thoughtful, he's reflective, he's, he's observing, and uh, not terribly venturesome, and maybe, maybe that w worked against him eventually. But I think there's, there's a very solid character there, and probably a great deal of integrity and honesty as well. The wind of change has swept more swiftly across Western Canada than Peter Fiddler might have predicted. But Fiddler, perhaps more than anyone, witnessed the true scope of the transformation and what it meant for everyone who lived here. Fiddler saw the homelands of the native people while knowing full well the forces that would cause such change. During his 33 years of service to the Hudson's Bay Company, Peter Fiddler left his footprints throughout what are now the western provinces of Manitoba, Saskatchewan and Alberta. He travelled 48,000 miles and surveyed 7,300 miles, surveys that would form a major contribution to the understanding of North American geography. As he travelled across the continent with his wife Mary, his family had grown. 
Mary had given birth to 14 children, 11 of whom had survived. This group of children went on to form the upper roots of a family tree containing over 50,000 descendants, many of whom found their homes in the land their ancestor charted. And through it all, the man who worked so tirelessly in service of the company which, for better or worse, had changed the face of what is now Canada, was denied the household name status bestowed on the men he worked alongside. Overshadowed by these larger-than-life contemporaries, muscled out of the historical spotlight by the bigger and the bolder. It's a bitter irony, fitting of Peter Fiddler's career, that the man who recorded so much would himself remain uncharted.